The following program was produced by an independent community producer. The opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the ECAT staff or board of directors. Giving a voice to the voiceless, pulling stories out of the shadows and putting them under the spotlight, making sure that each person is valued and cared for. This is Humanity First with Peter Evers, presented by BAMZ. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Humanity First. My name is Peter Evers, and I have the privilege of working at BAMZ. Uh, and uh, we are going to have a, a great show today, and we're going to talk about one of our services uh, at BAMZ, which is our helpline. And I think perhaps many people who are listening to this have benefited from Helpline. It is the uh, the very uh, definition of a multi-service agency when we're able to help people out with basic needs, um, it, you know, that people have for living. Uh, and that made me think a little bit uh, this, this week and last week because um, there was a vote uh, referendum in one of our neighboring communities, Milton, uh, and that um, referendum was around housing, uh, affordable housing for uh, working people, uh, part of the MBTA Act that uh, any town that has uh, an MBTA station has to have uh, housing that is affordable for people near the station, which makes an awful lot of sense. Um, this past week, the people of Milton voted against that um, in a referendum, which meant immediately that the state of Massachusetts announced that they would not be getting grants and help with uh, with other infrastructure projects that they have, um, which is a real shame uh, and totally antithetical to the uh, to what our uh, state uh, um, is proposing for people that is that we should be pr providing affordable houses for in, uh, homes for individuals and for families in a state where there's a lot of work to go around and that work isn't always um, paid at the highest levels. Um, we are not taking collective responsibility uh, for people uh, and we're not encouraging people to be in a situation where they can live affordably and they, they can work. Um, and as far as that goes, it really is a threat to our way of life because we're going to end up with cities where people can't afford to live who are providing services for people who can. Uh, and it would again be a, um, a, an example of us having a two-tiered system, which we nobody in this country wants, I am sure. Um, we're going to talk about Helpline uh, and what Helpline can do to help some of those people and maybe talk a little bit about what we can do to help people um, be uh, independent and grow their own wealth and income uh, as as they move through careers and, and what we can do to help with that. So we'll be back uh, in a few. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm an essential worker here at BAMSI and I'm a nurse. Nurses are essential here at BMZ because as nurses, we really have the opportunity to make an impact. We have very small ratios, so we have the opportunity to really learn everything about the person served and be able to give the best care. It really serves such a great purpose for me as being a nurse and really why I came into nursing. Learn more about nursing opportunities at bmzjobs.org. Giving a voice to the voiceless, pulling stories out of the shadows and putting them under the spotlight, making sure that each person is valued and cared for. This is Humanity First with Peter Evers, presented by BAMZ. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Humanity First. My name is Peter Evers, and as promised, we have a couple of superstar guests in the program today. Um, as you know, we often talk about programs that we have at BAMZ, an uh, organization that serves Brockton and beyond. Uh, and of those 120 so uh, programs, there is Helpline. And we have had many conversations about he Helpline in the past. Uh, and so our director of the program, um, Curtis Felix, Felix is here. Curtis, hi. Welcome to see you again. Thank you for having me. Nice for coming in. And also Alice Cole, who is our information and referral specialist. Hi, Alice. Hi, thanks. Good. Thanks for having us. Good. So, you know, Often I am, uh, whenever I'm talking about Bamsey, for instance, to the mayor, who is a regular contributor to this show, um, he will say, oh, Bamsey, yeah, Helpline. Helpline is so wonderful. And I always think of Helpline as a program that sort of packs a punch for its size. It's not a great big program like some of our residential programs, but it is doing work that is so important to the uh, citizens of, of Brockton. 
What I love about it is really is it's the definition of what a multi-service agency is. And, uh, you know, many years ago, I worked for Roxbury Multi-Service Center in the early 90s, and it, there was a helpline there. And it was um, it was on um, Blue Hill Avenue, and it was the most popular program in the agency in terms of people needing something. And when we look at need, right, and when we look at Ma- mm-hmm. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, shelter, housing, and sustenance, mm-hmm. of course, is right at the bottom of that. If you're not able to satisfy um, many of those needs, you can't really begin to think about therapeutic interventions, clinical work. So that's why it really is the pillar of of what we do. Uh, And the origin of Helpline goes way back, uh, probably 30 years in Bamsey, when somebody sort of said, you know, we need to be able to meet the needs of our population. Brockton, as we know, is a high need population. Uh, There is a great deal of uh, socioeconomic uh, pain in this uh, in this agency, and as we were talking about in the monologue, you know there are real problems in Brockton that need state assistance. Um, that really that that are in our schools and and in housing, and that I, I think reflects what um, in terms of the people who you're hearing from, Curtis. So let's begin, um, Curtis, maybe by just talking a little bit about Helpline. What do we do on a day-to-day basis? Absolutely. So the goal of the Helpline as an information referral program is to offer primary preventive services and to, as you said, to respond to local needs and offer social social services and information on obtaining those needs, whether it's resources, services, or um, programs within BMZ or even outside of BMZ. Um, the helpline provides help to people in need to meet their m- most basic needs, as we've said, things like rent and utility assistance, food, clothing, medical supplies, prescription drug assistance, shelter, uh, transportation, you know, other services just like those. Um, it's we 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 help a lot with immediate services and things that, like you said, are baseline you know have to have yeah. in order to survive day in and day out so um we 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 face a population that's not um not of of course not in the most desperate of needs but of course it's a population that needs services yeah yeah, yeah. you know i wonder you know this last four years have probably been the most difficult for many people in terms of the pandemic and in terms of the um the inflation that happened after that, and when you think about fuel, you know, fuel going up over those, over those times, I would imagine, um, I would imagine your work in terms of referrals in times when, you know, when times are difficult is is a lot heavier than your workload when it isn't uh, for populations like this. Do you, if let's say if fuel charges go up from right. say two fifty to four dollars like they did, are you immediately oh, let's ask you this question. Are you immediately inundated with help for fuel right. for well, instance? We, we have a lot of callers who need fuel assistance. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, some we can help, some we can't, but yes, there are a lot of callers and more generally utility assistance. Yeah. Um, electric gas so so oftentimes those are people those are families um, and this really is where the rubber meets the road isn't it these are families that are making difficult decisions on a daily basis they're making decisions about do i heat my house or do i feed my children right it, the decisions are very difficult because the math just does not work for a lot of people so yeah. you know it's really interesting in conventional wisdom and i read this out throughout my life that you know People who are poor, poor uh, aren't very good at budgeting. I would argue that they're brilliant. They're, they're very, they're very good at budgeting. Yeah, <laughs> they, they are. <laughs> yeah, because they have a lot of pro- practice doing that. Not right. You know, uh, people, people who have means are not thinking in terms of do I take half a pill today or a full pill. They're not right. thinking. You know, do I put food on the table and 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 uh, and go down and get um, uh, clothing for my kids so that we don't have to put the heat on. Right. Right. They deal with very hard questions. Yeah. Yes. There are, I mean, I, I think Bamsey comes at this work through a lens of social justice um, and, and many other types of justice. You know, we do an awful lot of work in this community. Um, I, I, I wonder why um, Brockton has really struggled um, sort of uh, socioeconomically over the years. Uh, Curtis, you've worked in and around this um, environment why? Why? Why is there so much need in Brockton? 
Oh, for one, Brockton has seen a large growth in terms of population. Already a small city surrounded by um, many small towns, you know, very small towns, especially a farming community almost, yeah. I think, in a couple of sure. border towns. But um, a s small city, large population, not enough resources. You know, it's a sort of an old, old age tale yeah. of um, just lack of need in a large population because it's not just Brockton that are at looking to access these resources. It's also the larger county, you know, surrounding Brockton as well, that um, are looking for the same type of services that, you know, we all, um, we all need to survive. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, often think about, um, about that. Brockton is a gateway city, right? And, and, and we're, proud of that you know i've worked in in brockton since 1990 and uh, and have seen waves of new americans come into to our community and um we have welcomed those people um with open arms over the years and that is a testament to the multicultural nature of the of, of the town i don't think necessarily it's got the support that it should have done from the state around that. And of course, we're seeing that with an influx of new Americans at the moment with the welcoming centers and the shelters. Um, are you experiencing any new need from the from the new Americans who are coming in um, and into the local shelters and the welcoming centers? Well, we do get some calls, people looking for immigration advice. So, you know, that does happen. Um, you know, they have a lot of the same issues that other callers have. You know, a lot of it is related to jobs, incomes, benefits, and... Yeah, linguistic so, issues, I should think, as yes. well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Healthcare is a big one as well. Accessing in, applying for as well is something that we've seen be a recurring theme in terms of um, new new families coming into new the, the community, basically. Um We've also seen an array of food insecurity as well, accessing you know, public services like DTA or WIC or food, local food pantries as well, getting um, you know, familiar with that as well and um, just you know, making sure that they are aware of the eligibilities that they do have to these um, services that you know, are seen baseline. Yeah. Yeah. And a reminder, you're listening to Humanity First here. And, um, you know, speaking of humanity and just a big plug for Bamsey doing its uh, food drive uh, every third Thursday of the month where we deliver about 70,000 pounds of 17,000 uh, pounds of food to uh, folks in our tile blocks. And, um, you know, <laughs> That is meeting a need, but there's so much more need than that. Um, Alice, talk us through what what does a normal day look like? Because maybe there's a bit of conventional wisdom that thinks like, "Oh, helpline just dole out money." Now I know that happens, and, and in a well, minute we, we we do dole out some money. We do, and and <laughs> but, in, a, in a moment I'll ask Curtis, "How do we get the money to dole out?" But first of all, to talk us through a normal day. What 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 kind of things do you come across? Well, I um, I take calls. And um, the typical caller, it might be regarding rental assistance. It might be about homelessness or near homelessness. It might be some kind of um, benefit issue, um, you know, maybe more personal situations or... So you might get a call from somebody who is in a domestic violence situation yes. that is looking for housing. So really, it really covers the whole gamut, yes, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You know, I think about transportation systems. There was a wonderful little, um, and people get mad at me for saying this, but there's a wonderful map, a, a meme, which is actually on uh, Instagram at the moment, where it shows the rail lines uh, of America, and then it shows the rail lines of Europe. And, you know, transportation has been always in this country something that you're on your own around pretty much. And I think BAT do a, a reasonable job, but transportation, especially for new Americans, is very, very difficult. If somebody had a car and that car broke down, could we help them fix it? There really, I have not come across much assistance for car repair, and I do get callers yeah. who, who need that. Yeah. Of course, you lose your car, then you lose your job, That's... and then it's all downhill from there. You know, there really is not that much assistance yeah. for cars, yeah, I don't so think. Something we should probably I, look into in terms right, of... Right, right. Yeah. So, Curtis, how do we get money? I mean, because many of our programs are funded by the state. Um, um, not really the case, right, with Helpline? Not currently, yes. So a lot of the funding that we get, we like to call through um, pass-through funds, um, is grant and, you know... Uh, 
yeah, grant based and um, contract based, which is means that we're doing a service for however long the contract is. Um, and that service can include something as small as maybe providing coats or, you know, um, helping folks with wrapped applications as well. Um, but usually we apply year, year round. We have a development team that's actively searching throughout the calendar year, as well as, um, you know, residual com contracts or grants that we usually get yearly. A lot of those are currently um, for elderly um you specifically utility assistance usually it's cold um usually it's for when the cold season happens yeah. um you know when folks see their you know national grid bill utility bills oil bills all increase um we usually have a lot of assistance geared towards that community yeah give a shout out to some of our big sponsors Oh, absolutely. Um, one of our great sponsors we have is the Goddard Wales Foundation. Yeah. They've been, a, since I've been with us, but I know they've been providing assistance uh, for, for the helpline for like a good decade or at least over a decade, um, as well as the, they just changed the name, Howard, Howard Foundation. I know they changed their name to something different. Yeah. So it's been another um, grant that's been great for us and yearly coming um, and increasing too, because the increasing I think is important. Because it's always nice if, you know, we get grant money to give out to this person served, but to be able to increase that um, availability or that fund, you know, it just makes it, it just helps us help the community as well. Yeah, well, you know, helping somebody a couple of years ago was probably 150% of the money that you're giving to people now because of inflation and, and you know, high uh, cost of living standards at the moment. You know, as I think about Helpline, it is um, it is so basic and, and in, in terms of meeting people's need and it's so understandable. And that's why I think sometimes people like the mayor are just so grateful because, because people really, really are sailing close to the wind when it comes to research resources when it comes to housing all of those things which are you know the basic needs of, of human beings one of the things I think about helpline a lot is could helpline what's the next stage for helpline and so as we as we think about help there's there's a you know the old adage of you know a hand out and hand up right that we can help people when they're in need which is so important but is the next phase of helpline to begin to help people to sort of stand on their own for instance there is a uh, there are social impact bonds, right? And so just very briefly, social impact bonds are actually offered by for-profit companies to invest in the success of a community. Um, in, in Britain, where I'm from, they did that with the probation service and the prison service in terms of um, making uh, d uh, developing programs that kept people out of incarceration, uh, which was massively successful. One of the things I think is that Brockton is a it's a young town um, compared to many others. Uh, there are many people who are um, have great energy and, and want to work, and oftentimes want to work for themselves. What about something like a, um, a hothouse project for growing young entrepreneurs, something like that with some social impact uh, uh, leverage as well? What do you think about that? Do you think that's the next stage for Helpline? Absolutely. I think in part, Especially COVID. COVID did a lot in terms of changing um, perspectives, changing where we want to service or mainly service. So, and as I said, the goal of the helpline is currently to, you know, for provide preventive services. And as great as providing preventive services are and much needed, you know, we we always want to uplift our person served as well. And in terms of uplifting, it's providing those resources or the capability, the, you know, the ability to uplift yourself or to um, find something, a supplemental income, additional income or something of the sorts for that person serve to get them out of their circumstance that they're in. Yeah. Yeah. Alice, do you, do you see that as the next step? I mean, you are, you're dealing with folks every day. You hear these stories every day. I'm sure we probably get people coming back quite often asking. Yes, we, we do. We have repeat callers. You know, I think a lot of it, the foundation of it is really income. I mean, Brockton is such a an expensive city that, you know, for somebody that's lower or middle income, you know, it's just not sufficient when you've got rents 2000 and up. So, 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you know, to, to further that uh, point, uh, I read that in 2000, the average cost of a house in Brockton was three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Now we're looking at four hundred fifty. So you know, this I don't know whether we can call this a gateway city anymore when it is so right. difficult to get here. And you know, many people are coming from Randolph. Mm -hmm. Many people are coming from uh, other places as well. It really is an issue of supply and demand, and um, and as I mentioned um, in at the top of the show, you know there are communities like Milton who have just voted uh, against having um, affordable uh, housing for working people near right. an MBTA line, and that's a sad reflection, I think, on on this joint responsibility that we all have. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I sorry, Alex. Did you did you want to say something? No. It, it, we have actually run out of time, but okay. uh, there is so much to talk about. And hopefully you can come back uh, in six months and we can check where, you, where you're at. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Alice, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.